I'm going to talk about uh, Canada's contributions to uh, technology and in particular computers. Uh, and I'm just wondering, is everyone in the room a Canadian? Is there any? <laughs> Who's a Canadian here? Be honest now. Oh, well, that's not too bad. I thought I may wind up with a room full of people who know more than I do, and um, that can almost be nervous, uh, nervous experience. Um, I think I remember hearing that Freddie Prince knew that any time you perform in front of an audience as a piano player, that there might be hundreds of people in the audience that are better piano players than he is. So it's always a hazard doing anything. Um, So don't feel necessary to, uh, to salute or to respond to uh, the national anthem of in, in any way because uh, typically what you find in most Canadians, we change the, the lyrics to the national anthem regularly in order to keep them as politically correct as possible. Um, so if you could ask 20 people from Canada what the lyrics were, um, they would probably all say something different and they might all be right too. So, um, but. Uh, Canada did invent some things. Uh, Canada did produce some uh, technicians that wound up uh, doing things that are, are memorable and in many cases moved over to uh, major U.S. corporations or they worked for a Canadian corporation that was bought out by U.S. corporations. Um, but generally speaking, uh, other than a few small examples like Northern Telecom and BlackBerry, there hasn't been too many instances of a, a Canadian company really dominating the market and not having someone come along and buy them. So uh, the, uh, um, in a lot of uh, the cases I'm going to explore here, you're going to find that the thing that we invented uh, was either invented somewhere else at the same time uh, or uh, where essentially the person who invented it just got paid a lot of money to shut the hell up and let someone who knew what to do with the invention uh, move ahead with it. Um, and uh, I'm just going to take this opportunity to mention as well, uh, I'm uh, really uh, fond of creating communities and uh, my career started uh, uh, working in uh, mainframe software development. I had a degree in, uh, uh, in business um, and um, accidentally found out I liked computers because that was something that was required. Uh, the, uh, the degree in business, I had to take one course in computer programming. Uh, and I took that course and decided, wow, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. Um, but I had to finish the, the BBA because my mom said so. Um, and uh, then I went right back to school again and got a degree in computer science. So if you can imagine, um, you know, the combination of knowledge of uh, business and accounting and also knowledge of computer programming, um, I spent most of the first part of my career writing payroll systems. Um, because, generally speaking, they're the most rule-driven systems that you might encounter. Um, but it's probably the least sexy thing you can do on a computer. It's a very complex process uh, that no one cares about as long as they get the amount of money they think they're entitled to get at a particular time frame. Um, so I, I was the founder of the Municipal Information Systems Association in Canada that's still operating. Um, and um, I was uh, also the founder of, as far as I know, maybe Canada's only a um, uh, computer club, like a, a vintage computer group. Um, there was one in uh, uh, Victoria, BC that was strictly Commodore, but I, I don't think they're operating anymore. There might be some in Ontario or other parts of Canada, but at least in Western Canada. Uh, we're the only group, we're not located in Vancouver, we're located near Vancouver, um, but uh, the reason it's where it is is because that's where I live. Um, and I was the guy who wanted to start it, so I um, had, I knew people uh, having worked in government that I could get favors from. So uh, I retired and uh, I approached the fellow who owned this uh, uh, building here. Uh, it's one of these um, uh, places where you uh, rent an office and everybody shares the coffee room and the receptionist and things like that. Um, so uh, once a month they give us the entire building and it gets turned into the fortress of olditude and uh, all of the people in the area who don't mind driving as far as Chilliwack get together and uh, show each other what we're doing, uh, sometimes sell or buy things, um, just more or less what you do here, just in a smaller scale. Uh, so that's the advertising that went along with this. Um, and it wouldn't be a Canadian presentation if I didn't say sorry a lot, particularly because I spent a good part of my career being in government, which meant that I was responsible for everything wrong that was ever done uh, by that government since the dawn of time. 
so you know, quite often you say sorry after each slide just to cover them all off. Um, and uh, it, it also helps in a discussion like this to um, explain um, how Canada is different um, because I think most, most people in the U.S. just assume that we're the same. We're close enough that we're probably the same, and that's mostly true. Um, you know, Canada is a lot like the U.S. Uh, there, our cultures are similar, the things we like are similar. Um, but we didn't have a big war to get to be a country, so generally our history is not as exciting, we'll, we'll freely admit. It, it was something that happened gradually over a long time. And the reason I explain this is that we get into the inventions by Canadians. There's a lot of gray area as to whether a person's a Canadian uh, or a British subject. Uh, because for a long time, British subjects could freely enter the, enter the country and live there and work there for as long as they wanted. Uh, my mother was one of them. Um, and then at some date, the rules changed. Nobody came and kicked her out. And so it wasn't until several years later that she discovered that she wasn't really a Canadian and wasn't allowed to be there anymore. Um, but that didn't make her leave. Um, so, you know, we are less interesting because, you know, we don't blow things up, uh, we don't have rockets, and we don't have anything on our national anthem that is really very descriptive of anything at all. Um, it, uh, I think it's well understood that Canadians are more polite uh, than most other nations. Uh, I don't know how we got that way, um, you know, maybe because we knew we didn't have the biggest guns or the best guns or whatever, we had to kind of apologize our way through you know, through the world and get the things we wanted to get. Because, uh, you know, some people just don't care, but there's lots of people who say, yeah, I don't really want to do what he wants me to do, but he's being so darn nice, it's hard to say no to him, you know. That's, a, that's our strategy for getting by. Um, and I, I think, unlike America, I've spent time in the United States, I've been to the uh, various different significant points of interest in various places, uh, and I have found things like uh, the Liberty Bell. I paid to go in to see the Liberty Bell Museum, and only once you get in there do you discover that the bell that's on, in there was believed to be the Liberty Bell when the museum was built, or at some point anyways. Um, they'd since figured out that that wasn't the actual bell, that the real Liberty Bell probably got sent back to England to a bell foundry, melted down and made into other bells. Um, you know, they... Um, uh, you know, I think uh, essentially the willingness to go with a story that's well understood um, is not one that exists in Canada. In Canada, we have to dissect our meals over and over again um, and distill it down to something that just makes it less certain. So once again, sorry. <laughs> Constantly concerned that, you know, if something I'm saying when I'm interpreting how Americans will see what I'm doing differently than I intend, uh, I need to apologize for that. Um, so as an example of how polite we are, um, every time we get together in a given location and uh, uh, you know, do something that's a, a public event, uh, we always start by acknowledging the First Nations that uh, uh, originally um, occupied this territory. Um, so every one of the presentations you'll see in Canada will start with uh, an acknowledgement that we're meeting today in the traditional territories of the, and I'll pronounce these wrong, Ochlone and Chumash people, we thank them for allowing us to meet and learn together on their territory. Um, I don't think Americans do this, or at least I haven't seen it anywhere that I've been. I see a few people shaking their heads there, so I think I got that right. So, you know, we acknowledge that the country that we're standing on usually isn't really our country, but, you know, the people that belong to are nice enough not to shoot at us when we got here, so, you know, we just stuck around and started naming things, um, you know, and so that's, I think, characteristic of Canada where, you know, we, we got our nation just by sneaking in through the back door so much that it was hard to make us all leave again. Um, and, you know, we, we see what happened historically in the U.S. and it is very exciting. I mean, you know, we get excited about it too. Um, but uh, Canada, on the other hand, like, my videos are not compatible with this, uh, uh, particular program, so I'm having to show them separately. Um, I'm going to show you a video. If I can get, get out there. There we go. Um, this is a video that's actually produced by the Canadian government to explain how Canada became Canada. 
uh, and it's from their own website. It's uh, called the National Heritage Minute. So that's sort of what we're all about. Um, you know, we, we kind of make Monty Python style mistakes, except that it's the real world, not, you know, some humorous video. So, uh, uh, you know, that's just a reflection of the fact that um, I think Canada was more like the United States in the 1960s and 70s uh, and is moving away from being the same, essentially establishing its own culture. Um, there's kind of a mix of the cultures and paying greater respect to the ones that are already here. Um, so now what I'm going to do is take you back uh, to the very early days of computing to look at some of the things that uh, Canada um, did that I think are significant bits of history. Um, I'm going to talk about the St. Lawrence Seaway, um, and normally this would not be a computer topic, but I'll explain how it is. Um, how it's related to, our, to what we're interested in. Um, we invented an assembly language, uh, or at least a Canadian did. Uh, and um, I think most people would look at that as, as though I'm insisting that we, we invented the comma. You go, comma? Well, didn't the comma already? Assembly language? Somebody invented it? It just didn't happen. It, actually, there was somebody who invented it, and I'm going to explain that. Uh, email, uh, we invented the video game. Um, does everybody know who, who, what the EDSAC is? It's a uh, computer uh, built in the UK uh, around the same time as the ENIAC, um, and uh, it's uh, uh, you know, somewhat connected to some of the crypto computing that the, uh, the Brits did. Um, and a Canadian was involved in it. Uh, the trackball, uh, joystick, sound card, um, all of those things invented by Canadians. Um, the PACX. Um, was a, uh, does everybody know what a, um, a PBX is? Uh, it's essentially a telephone switch that's just operating your building. Um, this was the same thing, but for computers to talk on. Um, and you didn't know that you needed it until you heard about it. Uh, by the time you heard about it, you didn't really need it anymore. <laughs> uh, GIS is Geographic Information Systems. Um, Compilers for Fortran, Pascal, and COBOL, I'll say sort of, and you'll see what I mean when we get there. Uh, we also invented the microcomputer before anyone else and the internet before anyone else. Um, so, um, so the St. Lawrence Seaway is um, kind of like the Panama Canal, it's a, a, except that it relies on the existence of a whole bunch of waterways, uh, and they simply built channels and locks in order to connect them so that you could sail from the Atlantic Ocean um, into the Great Lakes system and uh, large container ships could uh, travel a considerable distance west uh, rather than having to rely on coastal ports. Um, so uh, that was constructed as a, as a joint project and the, the thing that made it really complicated, it was going to affect water levels. And affecting water levels means that it either involves building big expensive structures to keep the water in place or buying a lot of land to let the water go where the go where the water wants to go. Um, so it, it would take a lot of computing to figure out what the impact of this uh, seaway would be. Um, and uh, they estimated that it would take about 10 person years worth of calculations. Uh, the first plan was to have everybody in Alberta and Saskatchewan do one calculation and mail it back in again. Um, but uh, uh, the uh, eventual solution was one that kind of made more sense. Um, and that was that um, through a fluke at the time, um, 
commercial manufactured computers were starting to become available, but it was really hard to get one. There was actually a lot more demand the production. They were very handmade. It took a long time. And we had the good fortune of um, being presented uh, by Ferranti, a computer that they built for a customer in the US uh, that canceled the project at the last minute. They already had the computer built. Um, it was already in North America. They said, you know, we can give you guys a really good deal on it. So uh, we wound up buying this Ferranti Mark I, uh, locating it at the University of Toronto. Um, and that's where Canada's first computing um, was established. And that was sort of the idea, well, one computer for all of Canada should be good enough. Um, so, you know, they bought this computer. Um, and it was remarkable in that it was, uh, we, we believe, the first computer ever to be connected uh, remotely, uh, where we use it to... Uh, uh, teletype machine, just like everyone else did, to talk to the computer, um, but we actually did it over public current loops so that the thing you were typing on wasn't in the same room as the computer. Um, not really, I think, that remarkable a technical uh, achievement, but definitely something that, you know, in a big empty place like Canada would be useful for solving problems. So we got this for Anti Mark I. Um, it was bigger than any computer in the United States. Um, and so when it came to doing the St. Lawrence Seaway, there was just no computer in the United States that could, uh, that could adequately process uh, all of that data, and it wound up being done by Canadians. Um, and of course, doing the numbers gave you a chance to kind of fudge things a little bit, um, and uh, ultimately, you know, our history states that the uh, St. Lawrence Seaway was constructed in a manner that was more beneficial to Canada than the U.S. Uh, simply because we were the ones controlling the computer. It's a situation that didn't last long. Every time Canada did something that outclassed something in the U.S., um, it uh, was either you know very embarrassing because you know we didn't want to we didn't want to make the U.S. look bad, um, or they were actually angry about it and we just needed to blow the thing up, set it on fire, destroy it, and pretend that it never happened. So uh, we're fairly good at, uh, at doing that sort of thing. Um, and um, we're also fairly good at coming up with ridiculous names for our computers. So this is the, the Mark I computer that we purchased. Um, it uh, was um, installed in uh, 1951. Um, it was uh, a thermionic valve system, so it was a vacuum tube computer for the most part. Um, and uh, it was also uh, primarily paid for by Atomic Energy Canada and uh, Ontario Hydro because they were the two organizations that needed a computer the most and were the most no motivated to give somebody the money. They needed a computer, but they never imagined that they'd know how to use one themselves. So they thought, well, we'll give it to a university. We'll tell them what the problems are. They'll program it, make it do things, and just give us the answer. Um, and that was sort of, at least in Canada, how the service bureau started to be a thing. Um, at this point, I'm going to talk about the uh, claim that we invented assembly language um, by explaining the people that were behind it. Uh, so in the very, very early days of computers, um, before you could go to a store and buy one, um, the way it was done is that you would license a design from somebody who had already designed a computer, and then you'd build it yourself. Um, and so um, uh, Dr. Uh, Donald Booth, uh, was uh, in the UK. Uh, he was um, a professor at Birkbeck College. Uh, he thought we should really have a computer science uh, program here at Birkbeck. Um, let's get a computer. Well, they didn't have very much money, and even if they did, nobody was offering a computer for sale. Uh, so he said, well, give me a thousand pounds, and I'll make us one. Uh, and he proceeded to do exactly that uh, with his wife, who was an undergraduate student that... Uh, uh, was reporting to him, um, and in what would be embarrassing and inappropriate now, um, uh, they became romantically involved and uh, she became his wife. Um, so uh, they worked together through most of their careers. Um, his wife, uh, Kathleen, uh, also had a PhD, but she never used doctor in her name because she thought it was just um, puffery. It was just to, you know, go around telling everyone you're a doctor, you know, don't don't tell me that. Show me what you actually did. That's what I care about. Uh, so there, there you have Doc, Dr. Booth, who you know wanted the word doctor every time you addressed him. 
uh, and his wife, who thought it was ridiculous. I mean, what, what more quintessential British couple could you get than that? But at any rate, they, they constructed a computer, uh, started a computer science program, um, and then at some point in some dispute that they didn't really want to make public, they decided that uh, there was no future for them at Birkbeck, um, and so they um, decided to come to Canada. Um, and both of them came to Canada. And they didn't have to apply or emigrate or anything. You just got yourself a plane ticket, you flew to Canada, you found a place to live and, and settled in, and that's it. There was really no distinction between Canadian and British subject at the time, other than it was clearly understood if you were born in Canada, um, then you may not have a right to claim British citizen. Really. I was born in Canada, for example. Uh, I have two relatives on two sides of my family that were British subjects, so I could just go there and say I want to be a British subject, um, but that's another story. Um, so um, both of them had this amazing list of accomplishments, uh, mostly uh, arising from this computer that they built for Birkbeck. Um, and um, uh, Donald, for example, was um, probably most uh, noted uh, in the field of mathematics for a particular algorithm that he uh, came up with. Uh, and in computer science, um, he invented the floppy disk. Now, I don't know that he invented all of the concepts that were used to build one, but he was uh, the first person to actually get a working magnetic floppy disk up and running. Um, while he was busy inventing things that were floppy, uh, his wife was inventing assembly language. Um, so you do have to wonder, how come he was famous and she wasn't? Uh, but that was just the way things worked in those days. And in fact, she invented a whole bunch of things, um, but she just didn't go around um, you know, telling too many people about it. Uh, so ultimately, the, uh, they moved from uh, the UK to Canada, um, and um, uh, Dr. Booth becomes a, uh, a prof at Royal Roads University in, uh, in Victoria, and that's where I meet him. Uh, I wasn't a student of Royal Roads, um, but uh, he circulated in the UVic uh, community, and I was a UVic student. Um, so I was 21 at the time that I met him. Uh, he would have been in his uh, late 40s or early 50s. He was there right from the beginning, right from the Manchester baby. He was present. wasn't actually involved in it, but he was you know, present in, in that community. Um, and um, he talked about computer science uh, and the early days of starting out, I was absolutely fascinated by this. I followed him around, I pestered him with questions. Um, you know, I would say that I was his friend, but I was probably a friend like that collection of fruit, fruit flies that follow, you know, people who enjoy alcohol too much. Um, you know, there are days that they're your only friends. <laughs> uh, but at any rate, uh, uh, I only knew his wife just briefly from having um, met her, and it wasn't until much later that I figured out, um, you know, really who, who was the brains in that family. So uh, I decided to look them up. I thought there was a pretty good chance that, uh, this was a couple of years ago, there was a pretty good chance that they might not be alive anymore. Um, but I did some searching and eventually found that Donald had, in fact, passed quite before I started looking. Um, but I found uh, their oldest daughter, Amanda, uh, who, in spite of being married and having kids, is still using Booth as her last name because it is a remarkable last name in the field of science. Um, and she started her career as a veterinarian in, in that field. And it, interesting also in their family, and being a doctor of of veterinary science doesn't make her a high achiever in her family. She's actually sort of considered to be the black sheep to some degree. <laughs> uh, and that's because everyone in, uh, in her family had managed to accomplish things in mathematics and she didn't pursue that field. Um, so, just. so this is um, her talking and I should qualify this. So she's 98 at this point. Um, so at the age of 98, all of my relatives have already gone. I don't, I don't have anybody close that lived that long. Uh, and to be 98 and still able to answer questions is really, really remarkable. Um, but she has the very same accent as my grandmother, and that's why I can understand what she's saying. You might get something out of it. Um, and I'm going to start this video. What happened was it, it you have to be there at the right time to talk to her because she isn't always really in a mood to talk. Uh, so uh, I sent questions to her daughter Amanda um, and she would record with her phone uh, asking her mother questions and then sending me the answers that were comprehensible. Um, and so, you know, as, as um, 
you know, difficult as you can see that would be, the fact that she's able to do this and answer these questions at all is m remarkable. Imagine your grandmother talking about computer science the way this lady can, right? I mean, I know people 20 years younger than her that say, oh no, I'm too old to learn all that. Sorry, you're not too old to learn all that. Uh, I'm gonna start it about halfway through because that's where she really gets into answering the question, and she answers the question as though it was her husband's accomplishment, even though it was not her husband's accomplishment, it was clearly hers. It was through the crystal graphic analysis. And um, this was what English really brought it on. And in those days, people did so. Going for a uh, uh, working out a scientific model of the structure of various sub um, various um, things, various oh what's the word I want to say. Yes, various substances. And uh, these are very laborious from the computer point of view. Lots and lots of us sitting down and doing multiplications and additions and subtraction. In other words, human computers. So essentially what sorry. Uh, essentially what she was saying there, just to paraphrase, uh, is that uh, they were uh, developing computers with uh, sponsors that were paying for the computers that they were working on. And one of their biggest sponsors uh, was a large um, rubber manufacturing uh, corporation uh, that um, needed to do calculations for the formulations of rubber. Um, and um, the uh, uh, work of converting those formulas to um, the kind of code that the machine could operate off of was very, very manual and time consuming. And uh, it was almost impossible for the people who actually understood the science um, to actually produce their own programs. So uh, she came up with assembly language as being a, a method of communication, essentially teaching the uh, people in the rubber industry, the engineers there, uh, how to use this sort of interim language that she created, and then that would make it easier for her and Donald and the grad students that they were working with to convert that into code that they could actually run on the, on the machines that they built. And their machines were uh, all um, uh, relay computers. They, there was no uh, thermionic valves in them. Uh, they relied almost exclusively on relays to accomplish the things they did. Um, and they used the, uh, the floppy disk uh, that Donald invented, which was not like what we think of where you can take disks in and out. It was simply a box with a disk inside it uh, that spun around um, on flexible media and a method of reading and writing to it, but it was mapped to the computer as though it was RAM. So there's no file system. It was simply a, a scratch pad location to, to hold code, code or data. Um, and so the, she came up with this as a way of essentially speeding up the work 
so that these engineers could um, more easily communicate the formulas that they wanted incorporated into the programs. Uh, so it was literally the uh, mother of necessity. Um, and so, um, you know, it's something where, um, you know, this lady, at the time that she did that, admittedly was a British subject, but even in everything they did after they came to Canada, uh, was, we weren't really a separate country at the time. So um, they spent most of their lives in Canada, and, you know, I think that spiritually I can claim that we invented assembly language. <laughs> but, but if you think I'm stretching it too much, then I'll say I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay, so email, I can say with complete confidence, we did definitely invent email, at least in the Windows uh, environment. That, uh, the time that uh, Windows first came out, there was really no mechanism for doing email from within Windows. There were DOS programs that would allow you to do it. Um, but uh, I was working in an environment where I was an IT manager. Uh, we had a mainframe, but we also had a local area network, and I wanted to move people from the mainframes email to the local area networks and having them use Windows and have to fall out to DOS to send a message did not work for me. Um, and so we did a bit of hunting around. In those days, we would go to things like Comdex. Uh, I would go to Comdex in uh, um, Las Vegas and find this company in Canada from Vancouver, like you know, less than an hour's drive from where I live. Lo and behold, it has solved this problem. So uh, the company was called Consumer Software, the product was uh, called Network Courier, um, and it was this great little mail program, and the really awesome thing about it was that it had a notifier that was a separate program, so you didn't have to have the mail client running all the time on your computer. This was back in the days when that mattered. You just had the l one little program running that would tell you when email had arrived, and then you'd open up the client. Uh, so it, its footprint was really, really small. Um, ultimately, what wound up happening is Microsoft acquired the entire company. Uh, they also needed an email product and discovered that this was about the best one out there. Um, and uh, they rebranded it. They just literally took it, released a new version. We even received the new version, even though we hadn't paid anything to Microsoft. And the only thing that changed is now it was Microsoft Mail instead of Network Courier. Um, they did produce a, a number of other versions of it after this, uh, and I think around the third version they changed it so the little tickler didn't exist anymore. You had to load and run the entire mail client having have it sit there eating up space on your computer all the time. Uh, and I wasn't really thrilled by that, but there wasn't really a lot of other alternatives, and over a period of time they eventually re released M Outlook, and that wasn't really that big of a deal anymore. Um, so uh, moving on to the next claim uh, that we invented the video game. Um, and if you look this up, if you Google it, you'll find some places that do acknowledge that a Canadian invented the video game. Um, there's lots of people who argue that, no, wait a minute, that thing it's on is not really a, a video screen or a CRT. Um, but, you know, if that is really a big deal to you, then sorry. Uh, at any rate, it uh, started with a, uh, an engineer uh, working for Rogers Vacuum Tubes, a company that uh, manufactured vacuum tubes for radios and TVs and things like that. Um, he was also very interested in computing and watching closely as to what was going on at uh, University of Toronto. This is prior to their purchase of the Ferranti computer. Uh, they were building their own small computer uh, as a proof of concept. Um, and um, he, um, having access to a tube ma manufacturing plant, said to himself, gee, it takes about 10 tubes to produce a, a one-bit adder um, if there was only a way of doing that more, in a more compact fashion. So he invented the Adatron tube, uh, which was a full one-bit adder in one single tube. Uh, it was a complex tube to construct, um, but once it was finished, it, it saved you a lot of time and money. Um, and as a demonstration um, project, he built this machine that was on display at the Canadian National Exhibition. Um, and it uh, um, played a game of tic-tac-toe uh, against the, uh, the people who stepped up to try it. Um, and those were the days when, generally speaking, the press had pushed forward this term uh, for computers as a giant brain, electronic brain, things like that. Uh, so that's why the term birdie Birdie the brain made sense in this context because that was the, the concept that they understood when it came to computing. Uh, but apparently played uh, 
tic-tac-toe at two different levels, uh, at a simpler level so that um, kids and other people could have a chance of winning, and then at a higher level where almost no one could win. Um, so this image of uh, comedian Danny Kay, does everybody know who Danny Kay is? He played in a, a lot of uh, kinds of silly comedies. Um, and I don't know how he happened to be there. I, I, my understanding was they didn't pay him to be there, but he was there. Uh, a newspaper reporter took a photo of him playing it, and then that sort of became iconic for the invention. Um, so as you can see, it's got a, a big square here with um, uh, X's and O's. They're basically transparencies with lights behind them. Um, so not truly a video screen, um, but in the time frame that this is all happening, at the 1950 CNE, uh, it does predate most other computerized games with a visual user interface like this. So uh, that's how we rationalized the claim that we invented the video game. It wasn't something that was commercialized. Um, they didn't make a lot of them and sell them. It's just a one demonstration project. Unfortunately, it was broken down for parts afterwards. Um, and um, it um, was a great showcase for the Adatron too, but damn it, the transistor got invented so, so quickly after this that uh, once again, uh, you know, we had another invention that was just awesome, but unfortunately a little bit too late. These I can get through. Um, so I'm also gonna talk about a lady that's, um, uh, well, I should say famous. She's not as famous as she should be. Um, her name is uh, Dr. Beatrice Worsley. Uh, she was a grad student um, that uh, stayed on at the University of Toronto. Um, she started out studying computer science so early in Canada that when she graduated, there were no computer science um, businesses or businesses that relied on that skill uh, for her to work for. So she was pretty much forced to have to go to the U.S. to actually find employment. Um, but she, as soon as she heard that the University of Toronto was getting uh, a Ferranti computer, she immediately, literally ran away from her old employer and got a job at the University of Toronto and became uh, part of that uh, project. Um, so uh, it happened that um, at the time they had just finished building their own demonstration computer. Um, they'd heard that uh, in uh, the UK this EDSAC computer was being completed and that uh, we were invited, Canada was invited to send some computer scientists there. So uh, she went there. Uh, in those days, it, it probably wasn't as remarkable to have a woman uh, appearing in that environment as it would have been, say, 10 years ago. You know, now it's becoming more normal. But early on, you seemed to see a lot more women, and then we got into an age where suddenly you didn't see them at all. Um, I'm not the guy to have the expertise to figure that out. It's simply an observation. Um, and so she was sent to Cambridge to be present for the completion of the EDSAC. Now the EDSAC was one of these, you know, huge giant brain style computers, uh, somewhat the same notions as the ENIAC, except that it was a computer that did run its programs uh, off of, in the form of software, essentially. The program occupied the same space in the computer as the data did. Um, it was a completely valve-based uh, system, uh, had a very short instruction set, uh, an 18-bit word, um, and that it prior, primarily relied on uh, uh, punch paper tape as, uh, as its input for programs, because those could be punched out on a, uh, um, offline on a teletype. Um, and it was, um, uh, they claim, the first von Neumann architecture computer. Uh, the Brits were a little bit ahead of the rest of the world in terms of that type of architecture. Had computers that didn't require physical rewiring to, to get them to do something else. Um, and so uh, uh, she went to this demonstration um, and uh, they had already built a similar computer. The Manchester Baby was related. They thought they knew what they were doing when they were designing this, but damn it, they couldn't get it to run any code. Um, even though the people who built it were there, uh, for some reason or another, there was something they missed and their code was simply not running. Um, she was able to figure out what the mistake was in a piece of code that she'd been working with another group of people on that wasn't working initially, uh, wound up being the first piece of code that was successfully executed on EDSAC. And um, it's, it's uh, well documented that she was the person who figured it out but she didn't wind up being famous as a consequence of it. Her face doesn't appear on the Canadian 
$2 bill or any other thing that we normally rely on for recognition. Um, but she's certainly somebody that I really admire um, that I think deserved more recognition than she got. Um, a trackball. Now, I don't know if this is relevant anymore because you hardly ever see a trackball anymore, but um, the history on the trackball is reasonably well understood. It was for a, um, a battlefield management software system that was being developed by Ferranti. Uh, Canada was a big customer of Ferranti's, bigger than the U.S. was, uh, since uh, the U.S. tended to favor their own local manufacturers for computers over a uh, British manufacturer. Um, but they designed this trackball as what they perceived to be a perfect input device for this uh, battlefield management system. Um, and all of that work happened in Canada. And now there was a lot of dispute as to whether Canada invented this uh, thing or not. It was uh, uh, engineers at um, Ferranti that invented it, but they were uh, working in Canada as Canadians. Um, and they, the evidence is, I think, pretty difficult to refute. This is the device, this is the original uh, photograph that was prepared for the patent registration, um, and that is a Canadian five-pin bowling ball. And if you've ever played Canadian bowling, it's a little small ball about the size of a grapefruit, um, but it's decorated with the same kind of swirly finish that a uh, big brother American ball would, uh, would be, and there's never any holes drilled in it because there's no finger holes in Canadian bowling balls. Um, so, in inventing a thing like this, finding an existing ball would make a heck of a lot of sense. Um, so it seems very certain that it was a Canadian bowling ball that was in there. Um, and that's the evidence that we rely on to claim that we invented the trackball. Unfortunately, the trackball hasn't wound up being a thing that, you know, had any staying power. I think you can still buy them, but there aren't many people that use them anymore. Uh, and that's why we don't have a picture of a trackball on the $2 bill. Um, we did kind of invent the joystick. Uh, <laughs> kind of, I mean, strictly in the context of the uh, um, IBM compatible systems, because of course the joystick predates computers. It was used in analog systems or radio transmitters and so forth. Um, and I don't know if anyone knows who exactly invented it. Um, but it was a Canadian company based in Vancouver, BC again, uh, Gravis, advanced Gravis Computer Technology uh, that developed initially this gamepad uh, as the first uh, Nintendo-style gamepad that could connect to uh, an IBM PC architecture system. Uh, and it became extremely popular as a, as a result. The joysticks that existed in, uh, for uh, that platform in those days tended to be uh, based on the joysticks used in radio control, and they were, you know, just a little small stick you're supposed to manipulate with your thumb, and it just wasn't really very enjoyable to use one in spite of the high prices. Um, so um, that's our claim to fame on the uh, on the joystick. On the subject of the sound card, we're pretty sure that at least in the IBM PC compatible marketplace. Um, we did invent the sound card. Uh, I don't think there's any dispute that the Creative Labs Sound Blaster probably was more ubiquitous. Um, and this is ignoring the fact that uh, the Apple II had sound cards available for it much earlier than this. Um, but in terms of the platforms that became most widely understood, uh, the um, folks at um, uh, AdLib uh, developed a sound card uh, that in 1987 for the IBM PC um, that relied on a Yamaha YM uh, 3812 sound chip, a chip that you'd find in a lot of other sound devices, um, and, uh, and it did a really great job of music. Um, it didn't do a really great job of sound effects. It was possible to make sound effects on it, um, but um, uh, the form of synthesis that's done in a Yamaha uh, 3812 is not the same synthesis model that, say, a SID chip uses, so uh, it's a little bit diff more difficult to understand how to produce a given sound from it. Um, and so difficulty meant that it wasn't widely adopted. And I think primarily its inability to uh, um, support digital audio um, was probably the main reason that it didn't wind up winning the war, um, but certainly in terms of the um, the IBM PC compatible systems, they were the first ones to land in that business. And I, I understand that these original AdLib sound cards are quite valuable now, just isn't that many around. And uh, I guess some people like the kind of uh, squeaky type sounds that came out of it. Uh, I own one that I keep in my IBM 5155, and 
Um, the computer doesn't do anything else really impressive, but it does make squeaky FM digital type sounds. So, uh, the um, uh, claim that we invented the um, uh, PBX for computers is probably not something that we get a, a lot of fight put up over because uh, really it's just really wound up being irrelevant. Uh, but Canada did have a telecommunications device manufacturer. They were known as Gandalf, based in Ontario. Um, and they mainly developed modems and line drivers, um, but they were actually ahead of the market in most cases. So they were the first company to offer a 2400 baud modem that could run on a regular lease line. They didn't have any conditioning on it. Um, and uh, that was faster than any of the competitors. It was also horrendously expensive. I think they were around $1,200 for each end. Um, and the technology was completely proprietary. So you, if you wanted to do this, you needed to buy one for each end. They couldn't interchange communications with any other brand of modem. But we bought lots of them. They did the job that we needed them to do. Um, and then all of a sudden, uh, the guys from US Robotics came along with a modem that went the same speed and wasn't proprietary, and we could buy modems from all different people. Well, uh, ultimately, that's, that spelled the death of uh, Gandalf. Um, but before they disappeared, they invented this thing called the um, computer exchange, uh, which was essentially like a, a wire, local, sorry, a local area network stuck all in one box. And you're going to say, well, isn't that the same thing as a mainframe? Well, it almost is. Um, but essentially, it was a box with a bunch of lines on it for terminal equipment. These could either be uh, microcomputers or just dumb terminals, a bunch of lines for host systems, and a user interface where caller could connect up to the, um, the exchange, uh, specify what host they wanted to talk to, and it would make the connection. Um, so it made, it made it easy for a person to be able to sit in their office and have one terminal that could talk to all the different devices that were all the different hosts that were owned by their company. Um, but uh, it uh, was invented just way too late. In by 1971, uh, networking technologies per starting to happen, uh, and it just wasn't a thing that, uh, that there was any market for. So, uh, you know, no one would uh, dispute us for making the claim that we invented it, um, but I don't think that many people care. Um, this next one is another one of these examples of a Canadian piece of Canadian history that if we were smart, we would just never talk about it. Um, but uh, is anybody aware of um, uh, a, a civil engineer in Canada or a mechanical engineer. Um, in Canada, they all wear a, uh, a really crudely wrought stainless steel ring on their finger. Um, and the tradition is that every Canadian engineer will be forced to remember an engineering mistake that, caught, that resulted in a bridge that collapsed. Uh, and they did so by turning the steel from that bridge into rings that engineers would wear. Uh, to remind them of that. Now, over the years, they ran out of that steel and they switched over to a steel that wouldn't rust. Um, but uh, remembering our mistakes is part of our, our culture. Um, and so the, the death ray was an unintentional death ray that caused people to suffer and caused people to die that arose from a software mistake. Um, so uh, this was a um, radiation therapy machine that was developed by Atomic Energy Canada and it used a DEC PDP-11 as its uh, built-in microcontroller, uh, or I wouldn't call it microcontroller, built-in con uh, machine controller anyways. Um, and these were relatively common in the med medical industry that the DEC produced these sort of uh, compressed down, uh, crippled little versions of the PDP-11 that were just there to add machine intelligence to something. Um, this machine had two uh, modes. Um, one mode was the electron mode. Um, the other mode was the x-ray mode. Uh, when the x-ray mode was operating, there was a screen that had to be there in order to control the amount of radiation that was administered for the x-ray. Uh, and there was a bug where if you put it into x-ray mode, sorry, if you put it into electron mode and then um, took it out of that mode without uh, actually delivering a dose. In other words, you did it by mistake and you reversed the mistake. Um, the screen didn't relocate the way it was intended to and the patient wound up getting a dose of unfiltered x-rays. Um, and um, uh, there was one example of, of uh, one um, uh, patient that actually uh, caught fire as a result of this. He was actually found on the floor in the, in the x-ray suite um, because he, in his writhing, had fallen off the table. 
Um, but uh, he was, I think, the first one to die. Um, and unfortunately, uh, to our detriment, we never really checked to see if, you know, we knew what the problem was before the machine was used for a few more people. Uh, eventually, the whole thing was, was understood. Um, and uh, I don't know if those were before the days when there were giant lawsuits for things like this. Uh, but it is something that we like to remind ourselves on a regular be uh, basis. We did not intend to invent the death ray, uh, but as a result of a software mistake, we invented the death ray. So, um, The geographic information systems, I think, are a little bit harder to make a claim on. Um, before uh, the MS-DOS days, there were some graphical terminals that could be used for mapping uh, connected to mainframe hosts. Um, but uh, I know in the uh, instances that I was involved in where they attempted to do this, the communication between some of those workstations and the machines that were going to host them uh, really resulted in something that was sl so slow that you couldn't actually get any work done with it. Um, and um, I worked for a, a, a level of government that had actually bought all the hardware for GIS, um, but when they put it all together, they just... Uh, it responded so slowly, they couldn't use it for anything. It just took them so long. Um, so in the end, they wound up just using the thing that had a standalone mode, used a Tektronix uh, uh, microcomputer as its core. Um, and they just wound up using the thing as a planimeter because that was the only practical use that they found in it. Um, and so um, simultaneously, as MS-DOS computers become popular, uh, two companies, uh, completely unrelated, both in Victoria, started developing GIS systems for the MS-DOS environment. Um, and um, they were both uh, successful in their own way. Uh, PAMAP was developing more with a system that designed to um, support urban land management. Uh, Terrasoc was more associated, more um, with uh, the cadaster side of mapping, where you're producing maps that uh, show you uh, the property ownership boundaries, uh, the zones, and in particular, the infrastructure underneath them. So it tended to be a little more oriented towards infrastructure management. Uh, of the two, Terrasoft definitely took it the furthest, and they produced a really terrific MS-DOS-based system for uh, doing uh, GIS on a continual, seamless basis. Uh, our city was one of the, I think ours is the second largest municipality in uh, uh, British Columbia, and when I say largest, based on land mass, uh, because it's not how many people live in the community that makes your job complicated, it's how many square kilometers there is. Uh, we were able to get our entire municipality and all of its infrastructure in one seamless file, um, and uh, that was something that uh, hadn't been done by anyone else on a mainframe or any other platform. Uh, they were very successful with the product, but ultimately what they weren't successful with doing is uh, getting over to the MS-DOS environment, or over to the Windows environment, um, and they lost their edge in the market. Uh, and in fact, when, a few years ago when I started uh, studying this, because I'd actually worked myself with the Terrasoft GIS, um, I managed to track down the two guys who owned the company and started it. Neither of them owned a copy of the program anymore. <laughs> Um, and so, uh, as far as I can tell right now, the only copy that exists in the world is the one that I own. Um, and, um, you know, ironically, I, I thought it was a really excellent effort on their part, but it didn't matter enough to them to even bother to keep a, you know, floppy disk around with a copy of the product on it. Um, but I could do a whole talk just on GIS, but that's not the objective here. Uh, I think we do have a really le legitimate claim to being able to produce a GIS system that was very widely used, ultimately supplanted by other Windows-based products that are uh, just as good, if not better. Um, but, you know, certainly the, the trail was blazed. Um, our claim to having invented COBOL wasn't that we invented COBOL. It's that we invented a version of COBOL um, that you could actually afford to use in a university setting. Uh, so when I first got out of school, um, I went to work for a company called Data Tech, uh, and um, they had started up as a service bureau providing data processing services to a customer base, uh, and they had two great big boroughs, B500 mainframes, and these were mainframes like they say in the history books where the entire ground floor of the building was just a giant computer room with a bunch of uh, mainframe hardware in it. Um, it um, one of the two um, had uh, 10 meg megabytes of, say the term, random access memory. 
um, which for a mainframe was just unbelievable. It was just huge. And it was probably the most powerful computer in Canada at the time it was established in the late 1960s. Um, but the way that it accomplished that was that it had a much smaller amount of core RAM and the um, rest of the RAM was a giant disk drive with uh, disks as big as a buzzsaw blade um, and in a uh, casing that looked like a Sears garden shed in terms of its overall dimensions and size. Um, and it was designed so that every track had its own fixed read-write head all the way along. There was no voice coil to, to select it. All of the selection was done uh, electrically and the disk spun fast enough that it seemed random, at least as a programmer, I didn't have to do anything special. Um, but I would write COBOL programs, um, and when I say write them, I mean I would take a pencil and draw them out on coding sheets, I'd hand them in, um, somebody down in the, uh, keep, um, the um, key operator's uh, uh, suite would uh, type them into punch cards, send them over to the uh, uh, data processing department, they would compile the program, send me a result, and then they would ex execute the program on the customer's data so I could see what the results were. So I never actually touched or operated any of these mainframes myself. My experience consisted of handing in paper and getting back other types of paper. Um, but considering the limitations of the machine, it ran COBOL. It took a fairly long time to compile a program, but did a really good job of optimizing it to use this, uh, this disk in the most efficient way because, of course, even though uh, it didn't have a voice coil. There was only two places on the surface of each platter that uh, um, a given track could be read, um, and it optimized the timing of the rotation of the disk in order to minimize the weight uh, that could arise from doing that. Um, and so the problem with that is that if you were a university wanting to teach people to write these programming languages, it just uses up way too much resources to, to get, you know, as the class sizes grew, they could no longer rely on nighttime processing in order to get everything done. Uh, so some uh, students at the University of Waterloo um, decided to build some compilers that were really, really minimal. They weren't highly efficient, but they were really minimal in terms of their consumption of, of um, uh, resources, and they were designed so that a student could hand in a deck with their program on, and then all of their data cards stuck right at the end of the deck. And then the compiler would automatically compile the program, uh, execute it on the basis of the data cards that were attached in behind, and then give you a, a printed result. Um, and uh, it was very widely used. I believe it was used all through the U.S. Um, it was um, known as what ball. They put the what was Waterloo. Um, in front of the name of each of the programming languages that they developed. Um, they worked it out on uh, an IBM um, uh, 7040, which I'm, I gather is a scientific machine. Um, and um, they decided to get into computing science so big that they went ahead and, and ordered two IBMs at the same time, a 1401 and a 7040. Um, and um, they had students enrolled. They offered the program. They thought they'd get maybe 40. Instead, they got 100. Um, and um, uh, there they were, you know, with uh, a really successful program. And just eight years later, um, this was what their computer room looked like. Um, I think it's the most beautiful computer room that I've ever seen, um, but I don't believe that anything works in there because it's way less messy than most computer rooms that I've seen. Um, and they actually paid for all of the computing equipment out of the building um, furniture budget. Uh, so that's pretty creative accounting. <laughs> um, but it did put them ahead, at least in terms of Canada, in terms of the uh, um, IT program that they had. Um, and that's what uh, gave them the resources that they could develop all of these specialized versions of compilers that were designed so that you could have a bunch of people. They ported them over to various different deck platforms. You have a bunch of students compiling their own programs, even. Um, and the time involved in doing that wouldn't drag the whole machine to its knees. Um, so they wrote these very efficient compilers. What 4 was their version of uh, Fortran. Um, they, uh, what 5 was uh, their Fortran 5. Um, they had uh, a version of Pascal called What Pass. Um, and um, as certainly any place that I ever went to in Canada, any educational institution, these were the compilers they were using. Um, and um, my understanding is that the same is true in uh, uh, many universities in the U.S. use these compilers as well. Then can I just see a show of hands? Anyone who lived, 
and was educated in the US ever encounter these? Because I don't, don't know how ubiquitous they were. See just one person. So um, sometimes it's hard to tell from Canada exactly what's going on at that level in other parts of the US. But, uh, but uh, uh, they did sell a lot of licenses to it. So whether it got used or not, there was a lot of uh, US institutions that had licenses. Um, they also developed this really great um, network operating system called Waterloo Ports. It was a competitor of um, 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 Novell Netware. Um, and uh, it was absolutely brilliant, um, but it was hard to understand and it literally never went anywhere. I, I, I don't know of a single instance of implementation, um, but it was a, another one of these brilliant Canadian concepts that just didn't wind up working out in, in the execution. Um, so, let's see, I'm basically at the end of my time now. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty close, to, pretty close anyways, yeah. Yeah, okay, so um, I think probably the most outlandish of my claims is that we invented the microcomputer, and I actually think that this one we're quite solid on. Um, so it's, you know, widely understood that the Altair 8800 was the first uh, microcomputer, and I gather as it was only sold as a kit, um, it wasn't exactly a household product. Um, so that, that dates 1974. Um, this was a microcomputer that was manufactured, sold, ready to run, uh, plunk it down on a desk and start computing um, by a Canadian uh, named Murkut. Um, and um, he designed this around the Intel 8008 processor. Um, the two rectangles you see here are uh, cassette tape drives, um, and there was no video screen uh, per se, but it used a, a Burroughs one line 32 character to display for the operator to see what was going on. Um, and uh, it came with uh, APL as its only programming language. Um, and um, they didn't sell a lot of them. I'm not aware that they sold any in the US. Uh, they sold a few hundred of them in Canada. Uh, at $5,000 in 1971, that was a pretty stiff price uh, for a small computer. Um, so, you know, I think get an A for effort. It certainly predates anything else that we've found, um, but does it really matter when you only sold 100 of them? I mean, it's sort of like, does everybody know the Kenback computer? Uh, it was a, not a microcomputer because it was constructed of discrete logics. It predates this as well. Um, but they didn't sell many of them because there just wasn't that much you could do with it, um, and they were expensive. Um, so this is my, my last slide. Um, we did also invent uh, the internet, um, although we're not sure that we knew that we were doing this. Uh, everybody's probably heard about these containers full of uh, microcomputers from the early 80s, the Naboo computers. Um, that um, Adrian Black sort of made famous by uh, mentioning on his blog. Um, and I, I don't know exactly who it is that was selling these things, but initially he reviewed one and said, you know, look, it's a brand new 1982 microcomputer with a Z80 in it. Uh, isn't it marvelous? But it doesn't do anything because it relied on a cable television network to provide the, the software for it. And in the absence of that network, there's no way to get anything on the machine. Um, but people went out and bought the things anyways, um, and now there's a whole bunch of people out there with these Naboo computers that uh, are uh, you know, finding ways to make them run software and reinventing the network. Apparently people did keep most of the code. Uh, they're out there, um, but uh, uh, the original service as it was structured was kind of internet-like. Uh, you know, it had video games on it. They were predominant, but it also had you know, chat and things like that. Um, you know, it provided email services. Many of the things that you would find on the internet, probably closer to CompuServe kind of a thing, um, but uh, there it was. Um, and um, we didn't really know it existed, most of us anyways. Uh, apparently it was on display in York University from 19, or, uh, 2009, I think, onward. Um, but who the heck goes to York University? Uh, you know, no, nobody, uh, for the most part, had noticed this. Uh, until Adrian came along and pointed out that this thing had happened. So uh, now it's gathered a, a really uh, huge uh, group of enthusiasts and it's uh, turning into a, 
uh, a piece of success for Canadians uh, by accident, more or less. It's sort of like our accidental naming of the country. Uh, sometimes we're just successful in spite of our, you know, uh, determined effort to do something that leads to not being successful. Um, so anyways, that's, that's my uh, uh, look on all of the great things that you all appreciate that Canadians innovated on, um, but we didn't quite, you know, hit the goal with. Um, but uh, that doesn't stop us. We're the kind of race that's uh, determined to, you know, uh, uh, keep doing things, uh, trying to strive, move forward, uh, make whatever contributions we can, and, uh, you know, get along with the other people that we find. Uh, so if uh, any of those things that I just said offend you, I'll close with sorry. Um, and um, if there's uh, any questions, I think we have just a tiny little bit of time. Yeah, I see one way in the back. Uh, Whatcom C compiler? Sorry, I didn't hear the... Oh, yeah. Uh, is the uh, University of Waterloo compiler in any way related to the uh, Watcom C compiler that was uh, for MS DOS? Yeah, um, I know that there were ports of the uh, Waterloo compilers that were available, um, and I believe the Watcom was um, derived from that original work, but I don't know the details of that. Um, but it, it is well recorded, and if you look around, you can find copies of versions that uh, were ported for MS DOS. Um, and um, I don't think it lived for a really long time because it wasn't long before uh, computers, microcomputers were powerful enough to run a full-blown compiler. Uh, what these did was they essentially compiled down to something that would be run in a runtime. So I don't think it, it compiled right down to machine code. It only compiled down to the pseudocode necessary for the runtime environment to be able to, to execute them. And of course, it would only execute them once, produce the output, and then throw the compiled version away, so all, all you were left with is the source code that you could execute again. Uh, it wasn't really designed for production software that you would run over and over again. Yeah, anyone else? Well, seeing none, thank you very much for your time, um, and I uh, hope I haven't offended anyone too much, um, but uh, I, uh, I certainly enjoyed having a chance to come up here and talk about the things that, uh, that interest me.